a bit about myself, um, just so you know why I'm teaching this course, where I'm coming from, and hopefully uh, assure you that I'm qualified to teach you. Um, I did my undergraduate in England at the University of Durham because um, I, I won a scholarship to study in the UK. I wanted to do child psychology, but for undergraduate degree, there isn't a degree in child psychology. So I did general psychology, and then I focused in my master's on social psychology and developmental psychology. So that's 社会心理学 and 发展心理学. Then PhD, I focus even more on developmental psychology, and that is my expertise. Okay? I'm a child psychologist. I'm now slowly interested, uh, beginning to show interest in adolescence. Am I speaking too fast? Good. Previous position. Um, I came to NTU in September of 2011. So I've only taught for one semester, but I have enjoyed myself a lot uh, because students at NTU are really serious, really great, uh, which is what I like. Um, I was an adjunct assistant professor and postdoctoral researcher at City University of New York. Um, and I came directly from there. So what do I do? Okay. I'm a developmental psychologist. I'm specifically interested in my research on children's autobiographical memory. What do children remember about past events? What has happened? Okay. Uh, the eyewitness testimony. And this is why I'm really interested in uh, developmental psychology. When children have been abused, when they have witnessed a crime, like a murder, uh, a theft, or their dad beating up their mom. What do they remember? What do they tell us? That's what I really am interested in. Um, and in relation to that, I'm interested in how we should interview children. Okay, when the children are interviewed by police, how should we train them? How should we educate them? Uh, and most recently, I'm interested in child abuse, domestic violence, and custody disputes. Okay, and those two are some of my papers. Now. The syllabus for general psychology, the required text, not really required, um, because all my PowerPoints will be based on the textbook. I do not need you to buy the textbook, okay? Because I, I, I think you don't need to spend that money, um, especially when all my PowerPoints are based on the textbook. So your exams will be based on the PowerPoints, okay? Um, Language of instruction, as I said, I will be teaching in English, but uh, I'm quite flexible, I hope. Attendance, oh, it's not a, it may be a departmental requirement, but I don't require it. So you may come, and I encourage you to come, because there will be lots of interesting discussions, but we'll talk about that later. Please be punctual and courteous. Uh, plagiarism will not be tolerated, etc., etc. And it's an open Q&A <coughs> style, meaning when I teach, you have a question, don't wait for three hours later to ask me. Ask me immediately. I think that's the best way you can get your thoughts going. Yes? Okay. And please be comfortable in doing that. When I first started teaching last semester, I noticed Taiwanese students are very shy. And it took me three classes for students to, to start talking. Uh, but it's a lot of fun. So please... Uh, Please interact with me, okay? Okay, background. I'm a bit worried now because um, I don't seem to have my 49 students on this list. Who is on my list here? Oh, okay, more. Who, who's, who can count very fast? Five, hands up, please. I need to have an idea. One, two, three, four. About 27? Yeah, 27, 28 ish. All right. I will learn about your background anyway. Um, I am not supposed to be taking any psychology students. Okay, this class is a Tong Su Ke, I think, and it's targeted towards uh, YC students, students who are not in psychology. So don't worry if you know nothing about psychology because that's the whole point. Okay, uh, degree and future, I don't really care. 
because it doesn't matter whether you're first year or fourth year, uh, you're all new to this. Learning styles, anyone want, care to share with me? Okay. You like visual stimuli? Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. If you're not happy for <laughs> during the next few weeks, do come and tell me. Okay. I'm very happy to hear your unhappy comments. Really. Expectations for this course. Uh, this one is tricky um, because I, I, when I came to NTU, I didn't know I was going to be teaching a Tongsu Ke. So I prepared my course as if I'm teaching psychology students. So it's going to be a lot for you, but it will be good for you, I promise. Okay? Specific skills you want to improve, you can tell me that in private. Course description. What is this course about? Well, we are going to explore the cognitive processes, social feeds, and behavioral accomplishments of which the human mind is capable. What are we capable of? Now, I'm not going to be teaching you how to read people's minds. Please, don't take this course with that mentality. Okay? You're learning things much deeper than that, uh, not reading other people's minds. And it never works anyway. It's just what you watch on TV. Okay? Um, this course is an overview. <coughs> overview, because psychology is a huge subject. So I'm giving you an overview of fundamental psychological concepts and the research methods used to study these concepts. Now, the approach I take might be a bit different from other kinds of Tongsu Ke or other uh, general psychology classes. I like to talk about research. And today, I'm already going to start telling you something about research in psychology. Okay? The kind of skills I'm hoping that you will improve, apart from improving your English, um, analytical and critical thinking. I will always give you a problem to think about, a question to answer, uh, usually in groups uh, because we have so many of you. Okay? And usually the three TAs and I, or maybe two TAs and I, depending who is filming, uh, will go to groups and listen to your discussions and facilitate your discussions, etc. Okay? So there's lots of discussions. Don't worry about presentations. This is your assignment for the, for the end of the semester. Brainstorming sessions would be ideas. When I ask you, what do you think about psychology? That's brainstorming. And we will share all our answers and comments. Okay? Essay writing, don't worry too much about this. I will tell you, uh, <clears throat> talk to you about assignments later on. Dissemination of research articles. How many of you have read a paper, a research paper? You're so shy. Okay. Um, well, I will give you research papers to read. One for your assignment and two uh, during the course, okay, during in class. By the end of the course, <clears throat> you have to be aware of the major psychological um, approaches to the study of behavior, human behavior specifically. I really won't be covering too much about the study of rats, etc., or primates. You have to be aware of the major aspects of behavior that are being studied by psychologists. Okay? When people ask you, oh, you studied general psychology, well, what are the major behaviors that have been studied? You have to be able to answer that. Okay? You will be familiar with the theories, major theories, and contributions of major figures in the field, okay? major psychologists. Or, in some cases, these people are not psychologists, who decide to study psychology. You have to be familiar with major research findings and theories in the field. You need to be conversant in the unique language of psychology, okay, basically knowing the terms that are usually used in psychology. Finally, being familiar with the methods of psychology. Okay? Doing research in chemistry is different from doing research in psychology. Doing research in anthropology is also different from doing research in psychology. So what is special about uh, the methods used in psychology? Okay. More objectives. You need to be able to gain self-understanding. Okay, not need to, but I hope you will uh, understand yourselves a bit more 
from this course because psychology involves a lot of introspection. What is introspection in Mandarin? Looking into yourself, okay? Understanding your own thoughts, your own feelings. Um, and having a great understanding of others, especially when I teach you social psychology. Um, being able to apply psychological findings to everyday life. When I teach you conformity in social psychology, how does that apply to you? Well, maybe when you're in class, you try to agree with those people you think are smarter than you. Is that conformity? You will also be able to appreciate the necessity of a multi-level explanation of behavior. Okay? When I smile at you, it has different reasons. Okay? I might, we might have a multi-level explanation. One, I'm nervous. I'm trying to suppress my nervousness by smiling at you. Two, I genuinely like you, therefore I'm smiling at you. What else? What might be another reason? Sorry? Sarcasm or something? Sarcasm, perhaps. Or three, it's a cultural norm for a teacher to be smiling at her students. Different levels, one society's norms, okay? Then there could be a, an individual level. I want to go through this first, just in case you want to drop out from this course because of assignments, okay? So that we can um, free up some space. Grading. Uh, maybe some of you have already uh, learned a bit about grading from your classmates, maybe who have taken my class or from that, that, that uh, forum called PTT or BBS, something like that. I don't know. I haven't seen it, but I heard that they have mentioned uh, my assignments. Now, 60% will go to your assignments because I believe your abilities are better measured using assignments. Okay? Um, there could be any problem uh, occurring during your exam, you might have a stomach ache, a headache, and I don't want you to lose that 50% uh, because of that. So this is kind of an insurance, 60%, that you will be able to pass and do well. Um, let's go through the different assignments. First assignment is a literature review. Does anyone know what a literature review is? Okay, it's all right. Um, I will give you papers to read. I will give you 10 topics. It could be something like um, gender differences in schooling. And I will give you two papers, I think two or three papers to read. And you have to tell me what you think about them. What do they tell you about gender and schooling? Okay, things like that. Uh, but don't worry too much about this. I will give you enough time and I will explain in detail. The second uh, assignment is a series of three reports uh, that you will write in class at the end of the class. Okay? Um, so you will have to attend those classes, but I will tell you beforehand what you need to, uh, when you need to come and what you need to do. It could be I'm teaching social psychology that day and at the end of the class I want you to write about what you've learned. Uh, I think they call it Xingde, yeah, if you've done it before. Assignment three, my favorite, um, and this was a lot of fun for me. I'm not sure for the students last semester, but I think it was because they did it so well. Um, it's a group research project. So you can select any topic in this course and propose a research question. For example, one of the projects from last semester was... Um, is astrological sign related to the, departmental, the department that you choose? Okay, your star sign and which department you choose. They didn't find a relationship. Um, <laughs> or the other one was um, what factors are involved in NTU dating relationships? How do uh, NTU male students and female students pick their girlfriends and boyfriends? And these there were only two guys in this project, uh, yet they managed to collect data from over 100 students. Uh, so the students really uh, worked very hard. Although, you know, it got off to a, a difficult start, but I'm here to guide you. And now that I have three TAs, 
uh, it's going to be uh, really fun. So you have to design a research project. For those who have you, of you who have not done research, please don't worry. That's the whole point. Why do I want to introduce research into a Tongsuke? Because I think too many students don't know what it is. And I think it's useful for you um, as you uh, finish your studies at NTU. If you want to go to graduate school, this is the best time to learn uh, the good and the bad about research. Okay? Time allocated uh, for discussions, meaning there will be some classes I will say we will spend the final 30 minutes to um, discuss your research project. Okay? Now, a pilot study is expected. Anyone know what a pilot study is? Either you're sleepy, you're shy, or you just don't want to talk to me. Or you really don't know. OK, a pilot study is basically trying out your study on a small number of people. Very simple. Testing whether your research is going to work. Um, so it's, it's funny that my students from last semester, they did their pilot study on a lot of people, more than 100. Uh, so that was a very big pilot study. So I would expect you to test your research perhaps on 5, 10, 10 20 uh, people, especially if you are doing your research on undergraduate students. Okay? But we will discuss that later on. Don't worry too much about it now. But this is the time to escape if you want to. Okay? Schedule. I will introduce you to psychology today. I will talk about the five major areas in psychology and get you to discuss uh, some media and talk to you about research. Next week, I will teach you research methods in psychology. Okay, this is where you really get to know how do we formulate a research question? How do we even think about method? What kind of people should we study? What kind of population should we study? Then third week, I'm going to cover nature-nurture, the nature-nurture debate. When we look at behavior, do we think about genes? Do we think about um, environment? Um, I, perhaps I will touch on evolution as well. But I will focus uh, mainly on the nature-nurture debate. Okay? Then the brain and the nervous system. Now, for those of you who do not like biology, don't worry. I'm coming up with all kinds of ways to make it um, less painful for you. Okay? <laughs> uh, sensation and perception will be the next one, then consciousness and learning, um, memory and thinking, and then week eight, I will spend the whole class helping you design your study, because by that time, you would have an idea about what it, it, what it means to study psychology. Okay? Then, your favorite exam. After the exam, I'll be teaching language and intelligence. Now, all these topics follow uh, the contents in the textbook. And then motivation and emotion is next. Social psychology, development, meaning from infancy to uh, late adulthood. Personality is next. Then psychopathology. What is that normal in uh, human behavior? Or what is atypical? Treatment of mental disorders uh, would be the final class. And week 17 would be presentations, review for the exam, and assignment three is due. Okay. And finally, the final exam. How to search for a research article? Um, it, I think it's a bit ambitious for me to, to show you this so early in the course, but I might as well put it in the syllabus. Okay? It's very easy. Just go to NTU Psychology webpage. Um, I'm not going to demonstrate it here, but click on Psych Info. It's just one of the titles on top. And enter your search terms. If you want to look at um, gender and motivation. Just search gender, motivation, and you'll have a list of uh, research associated with those topics. There are many areas of psychology, but there are five major areas. Um, and what I teach, all the topics that I showed you on the course schedule go under this umbrella, okay? one of these major areas. And what I like about psychology is that these areas interact with each other. Okay, it's very common for neuroscience to interact with development, uh, with clinical, with cognition. Cognition and social 
development and clinical, etc. I will go through each of these. Okay, you might not have never heard of uh, social psychology or developmental psychology. So the five major areas. I apologize for the white uh, print. Neuroscience from the top, then towards the right, cognition, clinical, social, and development. How many of you have done anything related to psychology? Okay. Neuroscience. These are the keywords that I think of when I talk about these major areas. Okay, brain function and activity would be one. And to study brain function and activity, we would use brain scans or imaging. Have you seen uh, brain imaging before? Brain scans. Okay, good. Thank you. Finally, someone being bold. Um, then in-depth neural activity, okay? not just studying which parts of the brain uh, are activated, but also neurally, um, how are they activated? Okay? Uh, the speed, perhaps, the intensity. Damage and repair, probably this is the main reason why that drives neuroscience. When there's brain damage, when there's brain dysfunction, how do we repair it? Okay, that's the whole point. Next, cognition, which is something related to what I do. Uh, the four major areas that I'm going to teach you. Memory, okay, this has to do with any forms of any types of memory. Long-term memory, short-term memory, autobiographical memory, Episodic memory, which is memory about events, um, traumatic memory, flashbulb memory, when September 11 occurred. What, what were the memories of people um, are in that area like? Those are usually called flashbulb memories. Okay? And I will touch on that um, when I teach you memory. Language. Language development is one of the biggest fields uh, to be studied. Okay? And it includes... Um, Topics like bilingualism. What does it mean to study two languages at the same time? Are children uh, capable of... How many languages are children capable of learning? And does that affect um, how they do other tasks? Things like that. Thinking, deductive reasoning, things like that. Consciousness. I won't touch on this too long. This usually covers dreaming. Um, etc. But I'm going to focus mostly on drug influence, okay, or the consequences of uh, drug use or alcohol use. The third major area is clinical, and the keywords I can think of would be dysfunction. People with mental illnesses, um, there is something uh, problematic about how they function. Can anyone tell me what mental illnesses come into your mind? Surely you know, uh, yes? Paranoia. What? Paranoia. Paranoia, yeah. Any other mental illnesses? PTSD. PTSD? Uh, schizophrenia. Schizophrenia? Depression. Depression, one of the most common, if not the most common one. Yes. Okay, and these, this is related to how we study abnormal development as well. When children show problems in their functioning, in their well-being, how do we go about studying it? How do we treat it? Okay, or prevention. How do we prevent some children uh, who grow up in poor homes or deprived homes to, from uh, doing badly in school? Things like that. Or from uh, suffering further from aut autism or other developmental disorders. Okay? Social psychology would involve uh, topics like personality versus context. When I observe a human behavior, is that due to the person's personality, okay, the person's characteristics, or is it due to the context? Well, he is behaving that way because the environment is making him behave that way. So this has always been a debate. Person versus situation. Then human interaction, that is key to social psychology. How do we interact with others? How do others influence us? And for those people we interact uh, consistently with, that involves relationships. Okay? The relationship I have with you will be very different from the relationship I have with my mother or my cat. Um, social cognition would be how do we process 
other people's emotions. How do we decide someone likes us or not? Things like that, okay? Finally, development, which is my expertise, um, would be the study of psychology across the lifespan. From infancy, and now I will actually teach you from before infancy, before the baby is even born, uh, prenatal development, what happens? How can a mother's health influence uh, the fetus? Okay? And so it starts from infancy, our prenatal development, infancy, early childhood, late childhood, adolescence, adulthood, and up to old age. And with this respect, the aging process. Now, when I teach you development, I will only focus really on infancy, childhood, uh, and maybe touch on adolescence. Okay? I won't really touch on the elderly population. They're very, very important, but I have to be uh, very focused in what I, what I teach you okay? with the little time we have. Thinking about the five major areas in psychology, how do we think about these five areas with respect to research? So I'm going to talk a bit about a study um, that has been done in the UK. Now the main question that we all have in the society today is, are online social networking sites affecting or changing our brains? A lot of parents are saying, well, internet is bad for my child. Spending three hours a day on Facebook is bad for my child. Is, is it affecting our brains? Is it making us less smart, etc.? If online social networking um, is affecting our brains, well, how is it doing it? So this study looked at the number of Facebook friends and differences in brain structure. Okay? And it, this study was conducted by people at the Institute of Cognitive Science at UCL in the UK. Okay, it was ambitious, um, but it was really a response to this question. And also because there were few people in the UK, powerful people, who were saying um, maybe uh, internet use is causing autism, or it's related to how, how much, how pervasive uh, autism is in the society today. So this was sort of a backlash, or if not, a response. So what the researchers did, they did brain scans, uh, MRI scans, okay, magnetic resonance imaging scans, on 165 volunteers, okay? Um, taking part in psychological research has to be voluntary. You can't force someone to, to join your research. These were healthy adult uh, volunteers, both male and female, I think. And these volunteers uh, were also asked to answer a questionnaire on their Facebook and real-world uh, network. So these are the kinds of questions they asked. This is actually the whole questionnaire. First of all, how many were present at your 18th or 21st birthday party? Now, as I'm reading these questions, I want you to think about them. Do you think these questions tell you enough about a person's Facebook, uh, online, or online and offline social networking? Okay. Second question, if you were going to have a party now, how many people would you invite? What is the total number of friends in your phone book? Write down the names of the people to whom you would send a text message marking a celebratory event. So basically, when you want to celebrate something, uh, who are the people you would contact? Okay? Birthday, Christmas, new job, good exam result, and how many people is that? The fifth question, write down the names of people in your phone book you would meet for a chat in a small group. How many people is that? What do you think about these questions so far? How about phone book? I wouldn't know how to answer this question. Do they mean phone book on our smartphone, on our cell phone, or the actual paper phone book? Uh, I have two kinds of phone book, and there are different people on those two phone books. And I actually don't even know how many people I have on my phone book. Yes? I think the questions are like really specific, because when it refers to 18th or 21st birthday party, I could like 
have a birthday party before, which still counts. Like, for me, I could say, like, okay, um, because some of my friends actually have a birthday, like, they think their birthday is the whole week. So we're celebrating, like, every single day. Okay. So what about, like, if I, I know it's kind of, like, weird, but what about, like, if I say, like, okay, I'm going to celebrate my birthday before, and the actual day of my birthday, I'm spending it with my family. It's still a birthday party, I feel. Good point. So the question is too specific. How many were present at your 18th or 21st birthday party? Uh, what she said is, well, one could have many parties, one with the family, one with the friends, um, or just having uh, several parties with several people throughout the week. Good point. Any other questions, concerns? Let's move on to the next set of questions. How many friends have you kept from school and university whom you could have a friendly conversation with now? How many friends do you have on Facebook? How many friends do you have from outside school or university? And write down the names of the people of whom you feel you could ask a favor and expect, it to, expect to have it granted that that person will do you a favor. How many people is that? How about this set of questions? Yes? Okay, so I think it's hard to draw the line or what she's saying is that the friends that you have on Facebook are not necessarily your close friends. Um, yes? No? Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay, so people respond to questions like question three uh, differently because they have a different interpretation of that question. Yes? Oh, did I see another hand? Any other comments or thoughts? Do we need air conditioning? Because I do. <laughs> Please uh, turn on the air conditioning if you can. Yes. Uh, I, I knew that there are some games on Facebook which will encourage you and other friends. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're speaking from experience. <laughs> I avoid all games on my Facebook. Um, I only have 30 friends on my Facebook because I'm very, very selective. Uh, it's, a, it's a good thing, really. Um, right, so basically you get a lot more friends through games, but these are friends you have never even met, possibly, okay? So just the number of friends of, or the word friends, what does that mean? Um, that leads to many different kinds of interpretation. Any other thoughts, concerns? Yes. In the background also make a difference. Like the ethnic group, the community. Sometimes some community, even if they're not close friends, they will grant you whatever you ask. But so I think everyone has a different or response. But culture and community, do you think that would influence online social networking? They're really f uh, interested in the online social networking part, not the offline friends. Do you think culture? different communities or everyone just has a lot of Facebook friends regardless or well, maybe not me but uh, regardless maybe that has to do with age not not culture and community what do you think why don't we get an idea how many Facebook friends do you have 
Okay, uh, let's, let's do, do it in range, okay? 10 to 30. <laughs> uh, oh, good, I have a friend. Um, 31 to, 50, uh, to 60. Actually, do you even know how many friends you have? <laughs> oh, yes, you do. Okay. Um, okay, uh, 60 to 80. Oh, goodness me. Um, more than 100? <laughs> I'm really glad you have such a nice social life. Um, doesn't mean I don't have a good social life. I'm just not good on Facebook, that's all. Okay. Um, any other questions or thoughts? All right. So, what did they find? Remember, they took MRI scans and they collected the answers from these two sets of questions. Okay. They found that Facebook users with the greatest number of friends on Facebook had more gray matter in brain regions linked to social skills. So there were three parts of the brain they found that had more gray matter in people with many Facebook friends. Why is gray matter important? Is it a good or a bad change? Guess. Yes. Good. You should have learned this in biology already, you know? Gray matter is important because it contains all your cells, and that's where a lot of important brain functioning occurs. And with aging, as we get older, our gray matter decreases. Or um, there's a lot of research that shows child abuse will also lead to decrease in gray matter in the brain. So it looks like you guys might have very nice brains, uh, especially linked to social skills. Now, I can't remember if they said what was the 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 magic number of number of Facebook friends. Um, but there seems to be a correlation. Now, it's a correlation, okay? meaning there's just a relationship. But the relationship can go both ways. So the question is, does social networking change brain structure? So as I make more friends on Facebook, that adds my gray matter starts building up in the brain in those uh, areas related to social skills. Or are people born with these kinds of brains, so more gray matter in these regions, are mo more likely to have Facebook friends? What do you think? The research they did could not answer this question. They only found a relationship, a correlation. Okay? It's not easy to establish a causal relationship, something causing the other. When the question asks, how many friends do you have on Facebook, do we need to think about changes in the number of friends on Facebook? Maybe this person, for example, my sister, she initially had 300. And then I told her, how many do you know? She said, I actually don't know. So I said, why don't you just, uh, what do you call it? Delete, cancel? Unfriend? No. What? <laughs> it's, I think they call it unfriend, don't they? Something like that. So she did. And now she's down to uh, 100 something. So what, how do we explain those changes? Or do we need to consider changes like that? When someone decides to add minus, add minus, add minus. What does that really tell us about changes in the brain? Or whether changes in the brain uh, is related to changes in number of Facebook friends? OK, thinking about psychology, I showed you a piece of research uh, just now. Now it's a case study, um, basically a newspaper uh, article or piece of news. And the big question is, should child criminal offenders be treated as adults? It's a huge debate in the US. How many of you are from the US? Four. Yeah. Five. Four. Five. OK. Um, have you heard about this debate? Have you read all the news? No? Oh, well, um, here you go. This was one of the biggest uh, cases to be mentioned in the media. 
U.S. child appeals against being tried for murder as an adult. Um, this was taken from the Guardian newspaper. Jordan Brown was 11 when he allegedly shot and killed his father's pregnant fiancée. His lawyers attempted to persuade an appeals court not to try him as an adult under America's harsh system of juvenile justice. And this was in Pennsylvania, where I think it's, they're probably the harshest on juvenile offenders. They're given, uh, many for murder are given life without parole. What did Brown do? What did Jordan do? He is accused of having killed Kenzie Hook in February 2009 at her home in the countryside about 35 miles northwest of Pittsburgh. According to the prosecution, he shot her through the back of the head as she slept in her bedroom. He is then alleged to have got on a school bus and gone to his elementary school as usual. Uh, the, the pregnant fiancé of his dad was, I think, two weeks to delivering, to having the baby. Okay, so she was heavily pregnant. He allegedly carried out the killing using his own hunting rifle, a shotgun designed specifically for children. The prosecution alleges that the killing was premeditated, that he planned it beforehand, and they found residue from the gun on Brown's shoulder. What do you think about this case? Yes? I see both sides, because in a way, it was premeditated. He knew what he was doing. He knew that if I shot this person, she will die. But also, he's young. He doesn't know in a way. He doesn't. He can't fully understand the consequences of his actions. So I can see it from both sides. OK, so there are two sides that one might think of it. On one hand, um, he killed a person knowing, per knowing very well the person would die. Um, especially when he has been hunting before. Um, I think he got his own hunting rifle because they live in a rural part of Pennsylvania um, and probably hunting is a common sport. That's why he has his own specifically designed. I think his shotgun probably is shortened. That's what's uh, special for ch child hunters. The, the father is guilty too for allowing the child to have the rifle. The problem is, it's legal. Yeah, yeah, okay, I know it's legal in the US, but. Uh, oh, I'm not justifying it, by the way. I, I, I'm just I, giving the facts. I yeah. feel like uh, this is like uh, encouraging, even when the, right? the, it's the child, so his mind is trying to information. Right. And so to let him have such a dangerous stuff in his hand. Uh, I guess his dad bought him the hunting rifle for use for hunting. Hunting, um, anyone from Pennsylvania, what do they hunt? Deer? I think it's deer. But anyway, the key of learning has how would they? How would children transition from killing animals to killing human beings? Do they see the difference? Okay, do they see the, his pregnant future mother a uh, uh, future yeah, mother as prey. Yes. Did he admit the kill, uh, that he killed her? Or yes, did he, he did. Okay. Any other thoughts? <coughs> yes. I think his father should not be responsible for the child's behavior uh, because I think that uh, if the father has to be responsible for his action, then how about the media? I mean, like newspaper or news on TV? Because uh, these media show like people shooting people by gun. So maybe the child get the information from the TV. And I think that the father shouldn't be responsible for this. Okay. Father shouldn't be responsible because there's enough violence on media to influence children now to commit horrific acts, to carry out violence. Hold on. Um, and all of us are talking about the question, why? Why did he do it? Yes? But I, I feel like, like she said, even though it's legal, like, though I, I do think the father is kind of like responsible because 
He was the one who got, I think, the gun for his children. Well, but this, this, would, this, if we're talking about who gave him the gun and why he has a gun, that would bring us back to the gun ownership law or gun possession law in the U.S. But let's, let's leave that for now. Now, the key question is, did this child understand what he did? Is an 11-year-old capable of um, making a moral decision like that, if you want to call it moral decision? Yes? Like, I would assume that the child was like, basically threatened by the, by the new baby, like, just that he wouldn't get the attention. And so like, to ensure that he would like, continue getting the attention, he would, like, wanted to get rid of the baby like, now, even before it was actually born, that by that, like, shooting, shooting at mother. Right, so, so uh, your kind of very basic clinical evaluation would be Maybe he has negative uh, uh, emotions, negative feelings towards this. I think she was young as well. She was quite young, younger than his, uh, his own biological mother. Um, I can't remember what happened to the other. I think the mother died, the first mother, mm -hmm. the biological mother. Um, and maybe he was jealous of the new baby, etc., etc. But there are many children who are jealous of a newborn sibling, a new sibling. Did he learn hunting from his father or some, someone else? I would assume it's from his father. So he, he shot the, or he educated him? That's <laughs> well, he <laughs> shot the father's fiancé. Yes. Now, it is likely that he doesn't see her as being part of the family. So it doesn't matter if his father loves her. Yes? But I think that is that the education to the children for that, and uh, how he take his angry or some negative feeling to what he will do to his negative feeling? Is that killing the uh, her father's his father's fiance is the one he do to make his negative feeling to be <coughs> active? But I think that if we, we educate him and he can just take the negative feeling to another way, but not killing. Okay, so he could have been treated. Okay, he might have anger management problems. He might have a lot of hostile feelings. Maybe if it was detected early enough, his father maybe perhaps sensed that my child is a bit violent, ag aggressive. He's very cold. Um, he shows maybe some sociopathic or psychopathic tendencies. I need to take him to a psychologist, a psychiatrist. Yes, perhaps it could have been avoided. Maybe that's why we cannot. Uh the, the what problem? Uh, the uh, gun problem. Yeah. Because uh, as you said, uh, a lot of children uh, sometimes can be uh, angry or don't want brother or sister, but they don't have a such a terrific uh, gun, mm -hmm. so they never do it. But maybe they are so Oh, of course, of course. We, we can't they have this yeah. gun. Yeah. So I think we cannot separate and when they judge. Him, but the problem is, it doesn't look like the gun possession law is going to change much. Okay, let's say in this decade uh, in, in the U.S. But we still need to make a decision on whether juveniles should be tried as adults. What happens when they commit murder while these gun laws are being fought in, in Congress? Something has to be done with juvenile offenders uh, or juvenile murderers. So, yeah? Okay, I, think, I think the issue here is that it was premeditated, and so he needs to be convicted. But he doesn't need to be convicted for life because he didn't understand the full implications of it. I think, th I think that, that will be the solution here. Okay, um, so eventually, yes, he was convicted, but not for life. Or I think he was uh, tentatively, well, definitely not life without parole. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes? Um, in my opinion, uh, from the way I look at it, it is an intentional planned murder instead of an accidental murder. So from that point of view, I think he shouldn't be considered a child when it comes to judgment. So who, how do we judge this? Who, who it has the power? Developmental psychologists, are we the best people to judge whether he was actually mentally sound to make that decision? Can we say with 100% accuracy that he knew what he was doing? Uh, I saw a hand. Where was the hand? Yes. Uh, we talked about that he was a hunter or a hunt, so you know that shooting someone means he died. But that, that's not the same as a murder. So even though we know that if I shoot this woman, she will die. He may not know the consequences, like what we talked about. So maybe it was like a planned murder. It was a shooting an animal for him. So right. So whether he, he saw the, 
pregnant fiance as a prey. Yeah, he didn't understand the, what would happen later on. So in that case, would it be murder as an ordinary murder because he wasn't developed as far in empathy by the people? I'm saying that was that people, not an animal. To be honest with you, I don't have an answer. Um, also because it's not really my area yet. I am now curious about it. I, I would like to study juvenile offenders at some point. Um, but this brings psychology and philosophy because we're talking about moral values, norms. What, it's a very fine line. And these children, to what, you know, think about what they're exposed to on a daily basis. Can we say it's the father's fault? But it doesn't matter whose fault is it. The fact is, is he supposed to get punished? Um, or should he get treatment first, then perhaps check whether he's likely to reoffend? A clinical psychiatrist or psychologist can easily evaluate whether he is a psychopath or a sociopath. And perhaps uh, the sentence could depend on that. Okay? He needs a psych evaluation uh, to see whether or not he feels any remorse. Apparently, he doesn't feel remorse. Uh, from, and that usually is the reason why juvenile uh, sentencing is so harsh in the US. Okay, so basically judges or jury members make this decision based on all previous cases. Okay, so it's a very, very big question, a very big dilemma. Now, I want you to think of this case in relation to the five major areas in psychology. Let's quickly shoot back. Oh, that's a very far back. Neuroscience. Okay, let me write it down for you. Think about these five major areas and make, help me make an association uh, with this case. Neuroscience. Are you going to raise your hand? No. How can we, what, what might we, how might we relate the study of the brain to this case? Yes. Right. His sentence would differ if um, he was judged to be, uh, you know, mentally insane or he has some kind of brain damage. So yes, we can use brain imaging, uh, get him to do an MRI scan to see whether his brain is significantly different from, uh, well, when he was tried, he was 13. But basically, check when he was 13. Uh, whether his brain was significantly different from the brains of a typical 13-year-old who has not committed murder or who has not committed any crime whatsoever, okay? Uh, or with a population, uh, which is better, a population of normal 13-year-olds. Uh, How about cognition? Yes. Did he understand what he was doing? Did he understand what he was doing? Yeah. Yes. The consequences. What else? How about in terms of memory, language? Maybe not so much language, but that would be going to thinking. Consciousness. Was he under the influence of any substance? Okay. Clinical. I already talked about a psych evaluation, determining whether he has a mental disorder, mental illness. Social psychology. Yes. Okay, yes. So maybe his uh, actions could be explained by his social relationships in school. Maybe he doesn't have any friends. What does that mean? Has he been bullied? Is this his way of, of uh, countering um, his bullying experiences? Developmental, probably the most important field uh, in relation to this. Maybe when his father was angry, he would go out and hunt, hunt the big children and kill them and kill them. So the brown do the same thing as his father. 
Oh, so he's basically um, imitating his father. Yeah. All right. So one uh, hypothesis would be that his father usually hunts to release his anger. Um, and therefore, this child has picked up on this, this, this method of anger management by hunting, by killing something, killing a live uh, animal and perhaps a person. Yes? And also the question <coughs> is um, whether it made any impact that the mother died very early so that she yeah, grew up without a real mother. Yeah, yeah. So how about the death of the mother? How much did it affect him? To what extent? How did it affect him? Why would the death of a mother lead to murder of a future mother? Anything else? Any thoughts? OK. Another way to think about psychology, and specifically um, these five areas would be to discuss some kind of media. Um, I did this last semester and it worked out very well. Let's show you a different picture this time. Try to come up with your own interpretation of it. Don't think too much about it. What is it? <coughs> what comes into your mind when you see this picture? Exposure. Okay, let, let's write it down because I seem to get very interesting. Um, <laughs> exclusion. From what? From the real world? What else? This is a real event. It's from my favorite uh, news website, Guardian. It's a British newspaper. And I love it because every week, um, I think it's every week, they have images from around the world. And this is where all the photos I'm giving you come from. So this is a, a real event. I didn't take this picture myself. What else? What do you think is happening there? Some what? Festival. Festival. What else? Art. Art. Irony. Irony. Protection. Protection. Oh, from. Protest. Uh, <laughs> 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 what department are you from? <laughs> Mad cow disease. But what's the chicken doing there? <laughs> <laughs> what? Eating chicken is safe. Oh, e eating chicken is safe. Yeah. <laughs> good, good hypothesis, yes? Uh, attention, needing attention. What else? Yes. Commercial. Commercial. Selling what exactly? <laughs> I'm trying to remember where was this picture. Oh, I think I remember. Experiment. Experiment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, any idea what experiment? No? Anything else? Talk show. Talk show. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen a talk show with animals? Uh, I mean, people dressed up as animals? Oh, talk show about mad cow disease. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes. Oh, just fun. Just fun? Yeah. Mm. The punishment of losing a game. Pa punishment of losing a game. 
Okay. <laughs> You're very uh, imaginative. Good. Punishment for losing something. Advertising. Advertising. Okay. So stroke commercial. Animal dancing. Uh, okay. Oh, yes. A disguise. If they were going to rob a bank, <coughs> they can dress up like that. If they want to rob a bank, yeah, they might well. dis. Uh, <laughs> that happened before, you know. Not as chicken and cows, but they did dress up in fancy dress to rob a bank. Yes? Halloween. Halloween. <laughs> okay. GMO. Okay. Uh, genetic modified food. So something to do with agriculture, fair to say. Okay, so what's, did I see your hand? Oh. It was a protest in a country in Europe. I think it was Germany. What would be the protest about? I think it was protests uh, to do with um, Animal protection, especially farm animals, abuse towards farm animals. Okay? Not sure why they're posing that way. I, I especially like the cow in the middle. <laughs> it's like, you know, like this. Uh, so that's what it was. Now, relate it to the five areas, please, although I've rubbed it all off. That's not the picture you're going to discuss. Neuroscience. How can we tie neuroscience with this kind of behavior? Do people who protest have different brains from people who do not protest? Protesters, protesters such as these, they're usually consistent protesters. They're usually very committed to a cause uh, compared with a person who might suddenly go to a protest once every five years. Okay, if we compare the brains of a committed protester and a, a typical, oh, I wouldn't say typical because protesting is not abnormal, um, with a non-protesting individual, will we see differences? And where would be the differences? Is it in social skills? Is it in memory? Is it in language? Is it left brain, right brain? Okay, so that is a possible question. Cognition. How would we tie cognition with this phenomena? Is it so difficult? Memory, language, consciousness, thinking. Yes. Okay. How they see um, animal protection is different from how others see it. Why did they pick this way to protest? Why dress up? Why not just hold a cardboard saying, I hate people who abuse animals? Why dress up? Because they think, yes? Because they can get more attention. They can get more attention, OK? Because to them, this is how society works. If we dress up as a chicken and cow, people are more likely to notice. They will question, why are we doing this? Oh, because there's animal, uh, farm animal abuse out there, OK? So basically, they, they think about what other people are thinking about them and deciding what method they should use 
to publicize their course. How about clinical? I highly doubt they're mentally insane or they have some kind of mental illness. But what, how can we tie in cl clinical with this phenomenon? Yes? Are they being uh, influenced by previous experience like maybe animal slaughters? Okay. S s by, by what? Animal slaughters. Slaughter. Animal slaughter. What do you mean their previous experience of animal slaughter? Okay. 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 Yes, perhaps they are particularly passionate about the course because of a childhood experience maybe of seeing animals being slaughtered. Um, I, I'm from Malaysia, and I grew up going to the traditional market, the Thai Sutang, every Saturday with my mom. And I used to see chickens being slaughtered right there and then. It was scary. And I actually never went back to that kind of traditional market again. I'm sorry, but I still eat chicken. <laughs> um, but, um, but yes, those kind of images is actually very frightening and uh, very gruesome to see a, a live animal just the throat being cut in front of you. So yes, maybe they have past experiences that lead them to behave in this way. Um, or previous trauma. How about social psychology? Yes. Maybe friends among them are Friends, of, they hang out with people who support the same cause and who are vegetarians. Right? So the network, the social network that you, um, you are in depends very much on whether or not you support the same cause. How about developmental? R very much related to what he said um, in terms of the clinical aspect. Okay, did he grow up um, supporting courses? I think I've seen children as young as eight, nine year olds uh, already protesting uh, about something. I'm not saying about a toy, but something more important. Um, and whether that has implications on how they are later on.